Thank you so much for speaking to Bloomberg. Now, you say that your strategy is well underway, that you're pleased with what's been achieved so far. When do you expect to return to profit? Well, RBS, I think, uh, is on track. We're making consistent progress. And in an important way, we reported £6 billion operating loss 2009. We've converted that to a £2 billion operating profit in 2010. Now, after payments to the government and, and the asset protection scheme and so on, you're right, that's still a bottom line loss. I hope we'll make more progress against that uh, and turn that uh, uh, into, into final profit, if you like, next year. But more important uh, than this issue, I think, is what's going on beneath the covers of RBS. And that is to say that our core businesses that power RBS, that is the source of our value and our future value, are doing well. They produce seven and a half billion pounds of profit, a 13% return on equity, so in excess of the cost of capital, we can do better with those businesses than we need to. And at the same time, while that profit is today still being eaten up in losses from the risks that weakened RBS, those losses are coming down dramatically as the risks that weakened RBS are brought down by us dramatically. And so whether that be halving the size of our non-core division, where the bad assets are, whether that bring, be bringing our capital and funding and balance sheet ratios in line with the best banks in the world. We're making good progress on risk reduction. It's still eating up the profits in our core bank, but that balance is changing, uh, and I think we can see increasingly uh, what RBS can be in the future, a strong, successful, fully private sector bank. So when do you expect to actually put the write-downs behind you? Well, I think that the write-downs uh, we're likely to spread over a number of years. It's a smart thing to do. There's no point uh, taking write-downs on an asset if you don't have a good market in which to do it. So we set out a five-year program for eliminating non-core. We're two years into that, three years left. Uh, so I, I expect, if you like, them to continue but on a reducing basis over those three years in the same way that we will target uh, the profits in our core business and the quality of those profits to go up in each of those years. And the balance, of course, uh, shifts nicely, I hope, in our shareholders' favor as we go through that. And of course, you were saying that your goal is to become a private bank. Do you have any indication on when the government may sell its stake? We have no indication. My guess is that the government uh, will need to wait until after the Independent Banking Commission recommendations and the dust, if any dust, has settled from that. So I don't think it's imminent. Uh, but w we are clear uh, that, um, of course, we have a big uh, shareholding base that's non-government at the moment, but increasing that privatization of RBS is a win-win for the economy and for RBS. I think it will be good for our investors, our staff and customers, and it will be a symbol, in addition to huge proceeds for the UK Exchequer, a symbol not just of RBS's turnaround, but I think of the country's recovery with it. So we hope privatization will come more onto the agenda uh, as we get past the Banking Commission. And our piece of that is to keep making RBS stronger and more successful, which we're trying. But you talk about this, this Banking Commission. Is the government not looking at a certain price at 50 pence, then they break even? Is that the kind of indication that you've been getting when they're thinking of selling their share? Uh, I, I don't discuss this with the government. You know, I think it's premature. Uh, I discuss how we're making RBS stronger, how we're contributing in all the different ways that we can to our customers, to our shareholders, uh, and then it's obviously their decision whether to sell, how to sell, when to sell. But their their investment price ranges from 32 to 65 pence. Yeah. Uh, that's over for them, but I think that, uh, that uh, that moment is coming closer, and if we can continue this evidence of our recovery, uh, that's the best thing we can do to make it a reality. So what would be your, your strongest hope? You have at the moment the backing of a lot of analysts and a lot of you know, the, the private shareholders. When are you hoping that the government may at least take a back seat? When are we going to see RBS 51%, for example, privately owned? I, again, I can't control when they sell shares, with what pace and what amount. Uh, and also, I think that the percentage is not the crucial thing. RBS is being managed commercially today. Of course, we're making it some compromise. Make but it does make a difference. But I think that the first privatization will be the key symbolic one, not the percentage immediately after that. Uh, and as I say, I hope that happens as soon as possible. I don't think that's imminent. Uh, and we still have plenty of work to do uh, to fully secure the proposition, which will then be marketed 
uh, in that, uh, uh, that uh, privatisation. But do you not believe that with a 51% privately owned, then you would be able to put in what you want to make the business much healthier and not have to follow the government guidance as closely, for example, for bonuses? Well, I think in the vast majority of important things, RBS is today being managed in the way we would manage it, whatever the ownership. Uh, and it is for a good reason, because uh, if we don't recover successfully and commercially, then the government ownership uh, won't be worth very much. Uh, and so uh, I don't feel that we're making huge compromises because of our ownership, and I feel I can uh, go and see investors, as I do all the time, uh, who are already big investors in our shares, uh, and say to them, we are following the right commercial strategy. Are there some compromises? Yes, there are. But, you know, every company, every bank uh, lives in the real world, has to make compromises to, uh, to external events and pressures and circumstances. Banks are politicized, mm -hmm. not just RBS. Uh, I think that we're dealing with that. Uh, I will like it when the pressures get less. Have you had any kind of approaches from the Qatar, the Qatar Authority? They're one of the names that you know, may look at buying some shares. Would it make a difference for you if the government were to uh, sell a share in a block or progressively? Look, we're relaxed about it. Uh, we're not out talking to people about privatization. I, I think it's premature. We do talk to investors all the time because there are many investors in our shares. You can buy our shares today, uh, and the more, the merrier, as far as I'm concerned. So my focus is really making the company better trying to explain that to anyone who's interested in listening, uh, and then it's up to our shareholders, in this case the government, uh, when they decide to sell and on what basis. How many millionaire bankers do you have? More than 100 or less than 100? You know, I, I think that this is not a useful line of, of discussion. The important thing for our shareholders uh, is uh, what do we pay our people and what do they produce? And so we have been the first, and I think we're the only UK bank, every quarter for every business we have to show people exactly the total pay, not just bonuses, not just the total pay, and what you get for it, what they're producing in profits, in revenues, and so on. Uh, those efficiency ratios, as I call them, what our shareholders get for our people's efforts, uh, stand good comparison, business by business, to the people against whom we compete. That's what's important to our shareholders. We must be good stewards of their money, uh, and uh, that is having good people, paying them fairly, but getting proper returns out of it. And if you speak to some analysts, actually, they're concerned about the contrary, that you are losing or are at risk of losing very able bankers because you can't pay them like some of your rivals. Is this a handicap? I think that the issue is broader than just pay. Uh, when you've been through the kind of smash that RBS went through two years ago, there are a whole series of things that make people who work at RBS feel beleaguered, uh, feel under-esteemed. Sometimes it can be pay and the pay pressures, other times it's, uh, it's job insecurity, uh, other times it's, if you like, uh, public opprobrium, uh, even though that may be related to the past, it still feels. So all of these things uh, are weights we carry around uh, and do uh, harm us in terms of our ability to retain and attract the best people. Uh, I've called them in the past damaging but not destructive. That's still how I describe them. Uh, but I do think that despite those handicaps, we're making progress. And I think as each step moves forward, we can demonstrate more clearly to our own people that there is something here to be proud of. There is a real achievement that together we're doing. Uh, and I think that that will help correct this issue, pay being part of it, uh, alongside the support that we give uh, to the community at whole. On the Banking Commission, is there a preference on what would be ring-fenced or not? Or because of the structure of RBS, would it make absolutely no difference to you? I think it's very hard to know what the Banking Commission is going to propose, still less uh, um, uh, how the government reacts to it. Uh, and of course, uh, they're looking at competition as well as issues of, of bank structure. Um, uh, and uh, simply what we've been trying to accomplish in our input uh, is to help illuminate what kinds of measures uh, actually may not contribute to safety at all, mm -hmm. what kinds of measures may be bad for the economy, may be bad for the other objectives that are part of the, uh, of, of the government's growth agenda looking forward and of the terms of reference of the Bank Commission. Uh, what they come out with, you know, we all have to see. But we have d different proposals. Do you believe that RBS may be actually better off than certain rivals because your structure is already ring-fencing certain divisions which are considered more risky? I, I think that um, uh, if there is an objective debate on 
uh, is the banking system under the international Basel rules getting where it should on safety? And are the mechanisms through resolution, living wills, bail-ins, getting there in terms of not requiring government capital? I think the rational answer to that is yes. The international measures are going to do the trick. And an individual country like the UK doesn't have to have a special set of extra measures uh, that can have the effect of damaging the economy, international competitiveness, without adding any meaningful safety. So I think that that's the right conclusion to draw, but I'm not making uh, uh, those decisions, and that's for others to do, and we simply will give our input. In terms of UK retailing, you've done extremely well compared to certain other rivals. What was your secret? How did you lure more customers? You know, what we're doing, actually, in every one of our businesses uh, is first trying to focus on how do we give customers better what they want. Sometimes that's service, uh, sometimes it's the kind of channels you deliver, uh, and so we're doing that in retail. Uh, we're also uh, trying to make all of our businesses more efficient, cutting costs. Sometimes that's so that we can reinvest in doing a better job for customers. Sometimes it's so we bring more to the bottom line. And the third thing in every one of our businesses is we're making them more balanced. So in retail, uh, for every loan we make, uh, we're trying to take in uh, a deposit as well. Uh, and those things, customer focus, cost re-engineering, and balance of the business, we think is the route to improve profitability. That's exactly what's happened in retail. It was our star performer last year. But most of our businesses had versions of the same recipe and were able to move forward. Mr. Hester, what keeps you up at night? What's the biggest concern for this year? We're seeing so much volatility on the markets right now. The situation seems to be pretty uncertain. Extra inflation coming from, of course, those oil prices after the unrest in North Africa. Are you concerned about this more than maybe anything else? Well, clearly, uh, we still have a very big company with many complex moving parts and things to accomplish in our recovery. So, frankly, most of my time I spend worrying about and hopefully doing something about making sure that the things RBS controls, uh, it does well, uh, and that we get stronger as a company for all concerned. Uh, now, it's true uh, that we inhabit an external environment, which while I think is generally recovering, has got uncertainties, bumps in the road, if you like, and some things that can be worse than that. We can't control those. We have to make ourselves more and more resilient uh, against them. Uh, and uh, I think that in the end, the world will, when we look back over one year, over three years, over five years, still have continued its recovery path. But that doesn't mean to say that there can't be you know, intensely worrying uh, and even damaging events along the way. Uh, we've seen some of those over the past year. I'm sure we'll see some more. A, d a double dip recession in the UK is still a possibility? You can't say, th you can't say anything is not a possibility, but I think the probability is for continued recovery albeit a recovery that is slow, is difficult, uh, has challenges. Uh, I think that's the probability for the UK, uh, and it's also the probability for RBS. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.